Merci en pile, Mona Lisa, pour l'introduction. Oui. Et c'est un, vraiment un moment très intéressant parce que mon collègue a blagué. Et nous pourrons parler vraiment sur une question que je pense qui est d'intérêt général. Et ces questions qui a brassé Bill Pays en jeudi, hein? et question constitution. Et ces questions qui implication diaspora dans le changement constitution, ça qui pourra le faire. Et je pense que grand pile monde qui intéressé et grand pile monde qui parlait de sujet ça, grand pile discussion, pile bagaille sur radio qui parlait, nous connaît gagné commission que le président a créé pour pour et, et réforme constitutionnelle là et également nous connaît que et gagné ministère des haïtiens vivant à l'étranger MAV et qui gagne à la tête le ministre Gonzague D qui lancé avec des organisations de la diaspora ils ont et ils ont chaîne réunion apparemment en Haïti qui était sous implication et, et diaspora non et, et réforme et constitutionnelle ça yo, qui t'a supposé fait. Alors Joe's Corner pour vraiment yon, yon espace pour commencer sous ça qui parlait vraiment sous question qui lié avec peut-être plus qu'à intéresser garçon plus souvent mais le pas pour garçon seulement et a gagné et sujet tant que sujet ça on va discuter aujourd'hui hein, qui c'est sous constitution hein, et a gagné et, et, et Mose Corner qui c'est pour Mona Lisa qui pour plus accentuer sur peut-être des sujets qui intéressaient mesdames yo. donc malgré que peut-être que des fois et semblait mettre garçon dehors mais nous monsieur c'est pour c'est en fait Bon, c'est Mose Corner a plus intéressant pour garçon toujours parce que c'est les gens qui ont qui ça m'a mis à penser. Uh, c'est ça qui fait que nous avons décidé que Game Mojo et puis a gagné Mose Corner and there is Joe's Corner, which gives each of us an opportunity to, to, to sort of talk about um, issues that we're passionate about or issues of interest um, that may go beyond sort of the larger Mojo issue. Donc, je dis en ces questions, ces questions constitution. Hein? et ces questions et implications diaspora. Et moi-même, j'ai une position qui est très souvent assez modérée. Premièrement, je pense que et, et pour prendre une décision, il est important pour que vous gagnez une information. Yo. Et non seulement pour que vous gagnez une information, yo, mais il faut comprendre le contexte information. Yo. Et moi, c'est que le débat a fait, malheureusement, et ce n'est pas le gouvernement qui a fait, c'est l'État en général, le gouvernement tout le pays qui toujours cherche un genre pour yo, et, et essayer d'influencer qui côté et qui gens, population réfléchit sur un sujet A ou bien sujet B. Et même, les, par exemple, il n'y a pas fait élection ou bien il a fait un référendum, par exemple, en Floride, il n'y a pas gardé référendum qui a été fait. N'a pas que même sous bulletin que yon imprimé, yon a des de, de consultants qui ki travaillent sous bulletin sa yo et qui décident, et par exemple, dans qui l'ordre yon a mis et choix yo. Et yon, par exemple, décide et mettre et yon imprimé et document yo et dans police ou bien font, that are really small, qui tout petit. Ils ont mis un paquet d'informations et les raisons qu'ils ont fait, ils connaissent très bien que la majorité ne prend pas prêt le temps pour lire tout ce détail. Ou bien, si ils mettent en pile d'informations et qui gagnent en pile de langage et légal là-dedans, ils ont perdu, ils ne comprennent pas. Et comme premier choix, c'est les mêmes, ils ont juste checké et ils ont l'an passé. Donc, ça, c'est pour un bagage qui est typiquement haïtien, c'est un bagage que nous toujours voulu rentrer, genre de discussion, ça, dans le cadre. Et, et ça que euh, en pile l'autre pays fait. Et sous question constitution également, parce que le débat qui a fait l'entrée souvent fait avec un pile malentendu. So, a lot of people here in the diaspora really do not understand what's happening um, and what's been done before. 
And so when you take it in the context of uh, what the country is experiencing, um, what you find is that the, the way in which the current administration position the constitutional, constitutional amendment makes it really interesting. It makes it really attractive, right? Because what you have is a government that says, look, we have a country that is unmanageable. And the reason why this country is unmanageable is because of these parties. In this particular instance, it is the legislative body, right? There are three branches of government, just like the United States. And there are ways that these three branches work, right? And just like the United States, the judicial branch is really, the judicial branch, the legislative branch is the one that makes the laws, <clears throat> right? And the judicial branch is the one that kind of um, uh, explain or apply the laws, right? Um, so in Haiti, you have a legislative branch after 1986 that has gotten a lot of power, a lot of authority, because um, you know after the elections, um, we have a French model of, 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 of a structure of government. There's a prime minister. And so the, the Senate and the deputies, the, the two chambers, the, the upper chamber, the, the Senate, and the lower chamber, the, 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 the deputies, decide um, what, who, becomes prime minister. I mean, the, the president submits a name and they then um, vote on whether this person will become prime minister or not. Um, the legislative branch is also the branch that votes on the budget. Um, the executive branch proposes a budget with the ministers and the legislative branch um, proposes changes and subsequently um, votes. On, on these um, on these corner on these uh, uh, on this budget, um, and the legislative branch once again, particularly the Senate, they vote on the the who's going to be the director general for the police department, et cetera, et cetera. So they do have a lot of power. And in the context of Haiti, where you know we all understand that there are a lot of um, corruption that takes place um, as a result, uh, you know the the elected official in the legislative branch tend to overstep, use their authority to kind of bribe um, the executive branch, right? Um, so it, it, it's a context that's really difficult. And, and, and really, when you look at it, you're like, yeah, we, we shouldn't have these guys with mostly guys because of the, of the 99, they're supposed to be uh, 30 sen senators and about 90 plus deputies um, depending on the number of communes, although a few more were created, um, they, you know, they they get to decide and 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 select the the, the minister, and so they kind of use that power to um, sometimes to uh, 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 extract right some things from from the executive branch. Um, and so, for many of our of our um, compatriots, it. It sounds attractive. It sounds relatively interesting to kind of say, well, if the legislative branch is the branch that's causing a problem in terms of the ability for the president to run the country, then let's just either get rid of it or minimize it. And, but what I find uh, interesting is that a lot of Haitian Americans, because I'm part, I'm talking particularly for folks who are here in the United States, understand the way that the system is made up here, which is the same as in Haiti, in that there is there are three branches of government, and the role that each branch play in the the separation of each of those branches. And in Haiti, when we as diaspora go back to Haiti, what saddens me and frustrates me, to, to, if I have to be honest about it, is that many of my compatriots are willing to throw out all the rationale, all of the things that they know um, that the way that a system should work, a system of check and balances should work. They throw that out the window and they say, because this is Haiti or because Haiti is not like the United States because it's too small. 
Some even go as far as saying maybe Haiti is not even ready for democracy. Um, many I have come across surprisingly have said that, you know, Haiti should have a strong man. <laughs> and and it, it saddens me because it shows that there is a lack of historical perspective. Mon yo pa vraiment comprendre côté des sorties qui bataille qui était faite pour des sorties dans dictature pour que jodi an mon yo a considéré que nous ta capable retourner dans dictature. Donc that's the context in which this conversation is taking place and that's the context in which they are offering the diaspora um to participate. And so the Haitian um, government uh, held a three-day meeting in which they invited some representatives of the diaspora. I'm not sure on what basis the, the organizations were selected, but nonetheless, they were invited and they went to Haiti and had some kind of conversation. Hopefully some kind of report will come out with the names of those who attended and what was decided. Um, and, and one of the key things that was attractive to a lot of diaspora is the idea that they, meaning this current government, is going to allow Haitian Americans or Haitian Cap Vive Canada or be in France, Haitians who are living outside of Haiti. Yo pral permet moun sa yo pou li an ganyen premièrement et double nationalité. Et malheureusement, c'est si une bagay que en pile moun peut-être pas connaît. And that today um if you are a Haitian American, you already have double nationality. And that is as a result of the last amendment that took place in 2012, which allows or removed rather the limitation on not having two nationalities, right? And so, you know, someone like me, for example, who's Haitian American who has a US passport, um, also have a Haitian passport. Um, when I was in Haiti, I voted um, in, the, in the election um, got my card and, you know, went and vote because I am Haitian. I am Haitian American, but I'm Haitian. Um, and so I think that's the, that's the first point, right? Is that there is, you know, this, this sort of, um, uh, gift that they're going to give to the diaspora, to the Haitian American community, which is that Haitians are now going to have double nationality. Um, so surprise, um, nothing new there, right? <laughs> it's already there. Donc, yo pral ba nou bagay ki ngen deja. Um, and by the way, I I I want to, you know, make this I I know I'm going to make it a bit of a monologue today because it is the first the first show and I want to make this show really one in which, you know, you can reach out and you can ask me questions and we can have a bit of a conversation about those issues and about those those questions. Um, don't hesitate uh, uh, to ask me questions because I I can hopefully try my best to uh, answer it. And if I don't, I will certainly bring back the answer in the next time. Don't if we go back. There is no. Um, uh, there's nothing new. Right, as a Haitian American today, the constitution allows you to have another nationality. You can be Haitian and American, you can be Haitian Canadian, you can be Haitian, um, uh, Franco Haitian, et cetera, right? Um, what that means also, what the constitution allows is that as a Haitian, um, your child, is also Haitian. And tout connaît parce que depuis depuis gon haïtien, petit ton haïtien qui font gros bagay, uh, tout le monde, everybody's happy, everybody's, you know, Naomi is Haitian American and everybody else is Haitian American. Um because they have that option, right? 
Um, Naomi is an interesting, interesting example, even though she goes to Haiti all the time. Um, when she had a choice to pick because she was, she was born in Japan, her mom is Japanese, her dad is, is, is uh, um, uh, Haitian American. She grew up in, 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 in the States, so she has both nationalities. She had to make a choice because um, Japan requires that she does to make that choice and she chose the, the Japanese nationality. Um, and so she's Japanese, but as, as far as Haiti is concerned, it says that if one of your parents is Haitian, you Haitian. So that means if she chooses, she can actually um, get her Haitian passport and she can vote in the Haitian elections. Donc, moi, c'est que ça, c'est le premier point qui est important pour et en pile monde comprendre. Et aussi, depuis au côté fait Haïti, ou bien que parents, c'est haïtien, y'a un parent, ou pas tous les deux, c'est haïtien, et ou gagné, ou nat, naturellement, normalement, gagné et nationalité haïtienne, ou lien, it's up to you to do the administrative processes to actually get your paperwork, right? So it's up to you to bring to the consulate nearby you or the embassy um, the birth certificate of one of your parents. And I think there are some other things that they ask you for so that you can get a Haitian passport and then eventually get a um, your national ID card. Which brings me to the second point. The ability for Haitian Americans or for Haitians who live abroad to vote and elections that are taking place in Haiti is purely a limitation of administrative processes that the government has never put in place. Donc, ma dit c'est que seul bagaille qui limite yon moun kap vive aux États-Unis, en France, au Canada, Sainte République Dominicaine, etc., et Bahamas, quel que soit côté lié, hein? Seul ça qui limite l pour que les pas qu'à voter non y ont élection en Haïti, c'est parce que l'État pas mettait en place et, et capacité pour mon ça capable de voter côté lié. Vive ici New York, dans zone côté méditerranéen, c'est les Washington Heights et Washington Heights c'est une zone côté qui gagne pile dominicain. Je dis que les élections en République dominicaine, et c'est comme si dans la zone côté méditerranéen, c'est la République dominicaine, mais tellement gagné affiches et gagné camions, kap, ba, musique, mon cap danser, toute qualité bagay et mobilisation pour élection, pour qui ça? Parce que les communautés dominicaines, New York, là, capables voter dans élection en Haïti. Et oui, 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 et, et chance, if the, the question is uh, saying that the Haitian diaspora can vote in Haiti elections. So, again, let me just summarize for you. Number one, for you to be able to vote in another country's, another country, somewhere, you know, in the elections of Haiti or somewhere else, first you have to be a citizen of that country. And so as a Haitian American, either you were born in Haiti and you came to the States and you got with your green card and then you became a citizen, or you were born here of Haitian parents, the constitutional, the constitution that we have today, which was amended in 2012, 2011, um, has removed any limitations and allows um, for dual national ID to exist in Haiti. So therefore, you can have your U.S. citizenship as well as your Haitian citizenship, which I have. I have a Haitian passport as well as a U.S. passport. So you have those two. So that's the first thing. The second thing is your ability to, to, to vote in the elections. And that's where we have a problem. Um, today, the Haitian government and by Haitian government, I mean the Electoral Council, le CEP, um, uh, 
have not put in place, right, the facilities for you to vote. And so, for example, my, you know, my ability to vote in Haiti's election requires that I would have to fly to Haiti to, to, to vote in, in Haitian elections. Whereas every other place, right, um, allows their citizens from wherever they are to vote. So for example, if you are Haitian American, you have a US passport. This past election in November, you were able to send in your ballots or request your ballots from whatever state you were from and vote while you were in Haiti, right? So you didn't have to fly back to the US to vote. Now, this last election was so special. I, I have a lot of friends who had decided they don't want to risk sending their, their ballots via the mail and have it be lost because all the problems with the post office, yada, yada, yada. They decided to fly in because this was something really special. And we we're all very happy for that. But they didn't have to come to, to the United States to vote. They were able to be in Haiti and the US um, facilitated their ability to vote wherever they are. You probably all have heard about you know, soldiers who are overseas or Americans who are overseas that they're waiting for their ballots to come in, right? Because they vote where they are in the country where they are. So a constitutional amendment does not give us anything more, right? You can vote because you're a citizen. What you need is the ability to vote. You need to go to a place to vote. And that is not a constitutional problem, right? That is an administrative problem. Well, there's a piece of law, which is um, what the electoral council has to vote because every single election, they vote a new law for that election. Um, we don't need to go into all those details, but once they, the electoral council, which is the body that is responsible for organizing and managing the election, the electoral process. They pass their laws. They say, you know, here is what you need to have for you to be able to vote. Um, they could have said that, you know, Haitians who are living in the DR and and uh, in Bahamas and Chile um, in the U.S. Um, and 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 Canada and France can vote. The responsibility for those citizens to have access to a card to vote falls on another um, institution that is called ONI, right? Which is the organization that is responsible for providing national ID card to all Haitian, which uh, they're running into a lot of problems providing ID cards to people in Haiti. Um, now, that said, if they had the willingness, if they had real, really the intention to allow Haitian Americans to be able to vote, they would have made the, the, the ID card available at the consulates, right? In Boston, in New York, in Atlanta, at the embassy in, in, in Washington, DC, at the consulate in Miami. And people would, would get their ID card. And then during election times, they would organize you know, spaces and libraries and school spaces, whatever, for people to go and vote. So it's, it's not a constitutional problem. And so I think this is the first thing that they're trying to bamboozle us um, to think that we need to have a constitutional amendment to be Haitians. And that is absolutely false. And unfortunately, not enough people know about this. And because they think that they're gonna get this new right, they're kind of open to the idea of, yes, let's, let's modify uh, the election, right? The second thing is, the third thing rather, is that Many people, you know, like I said earlier when I started, feel that um, they we need to change the constitution because there is an opening, and that's the argument I hear quite a bit 
there is an opening now um, while parliament has been disbanded for the president um, by himself to, let me not say the president, although it is the president, but let's just say the executive branch by itself to go ahead and make the constitutional changes that are required in which what we hear is that they would be able to, um, they, they're considering um, eliminating the Senate and only have the lower house, the deputies, they would eliminate the number of um, deputies, all good things. I think most people would say that seems rational because Haiti is a small country, it doesn't have a lot of money. So why do we need all these elected officials? And these people are terrible. They're just leeches who are, you know, sucking up the resources of the country and, you know, polluting our country really in many ways because many of them are criminals. So yeah, let's get rid of them, right? It sounds good. Um, but this is where I have a problem with some friends of mine that I respect who, who kind of um, um, go along with that, right? Um, so, so the thing is that a president gets elected and takes an oath on a constitution that he swears that he will apply and protect. The idea that that president could then say, this constitution that I swore to protect gives me legitimacy to be president, can at the same time say this constitution, which has certain articles in it that prohibits me from doing certain things, I will set aside, you know, those prohibition, those things that I'm not supposed to do because the constitution tells me I cannot. I will just set them aside. I will just disre disregard them um, and go ahead and do what I wanna do. So what are those things, right? Um, the Constitution uh, in its article in Title 13, and particularly in Article 282 and 282.1, um, specifically says how one can go and begin the amendment process. And that process, reason, reason has to be given in one or, 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 the, or of the two chambers um, or the executive branch can recommend that there is an amendment. And then the legislature would have to then declare that the constitution should be amended. Um, that declaration must be supported by two thirds of both chambers. And there are reasons for that because we cannot all the time willy-nilly just decide that we're going to change the constitution because somebody feels like it, right? Donc, l'important pour nous comprendre que un président qui 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 lui-même est sermenté sur une constitution et ces constitutions ça qui bâlit toute légitimité que le gagne pour le cas président pas capable de décider pour contre du jour au lendemain que la choisi qui a tiqué dans la constitution ça la prend qui a tiqué dans la constitution ça la retirer et et et, et j'enlever et parce que c'est n'est pas possible pour que même constitution ça bon légitimité et puis même constitution ça on pas respecter it's true that we've never really as a, as a country respected the constitution but it shouldn't be what we strive for we should be striving to stay as close to the constitution. Well, we should be striving to stay within the constitution, but if we can't, we should be striving to stay as close to the constitution as possible. So the idea that, you know, the president today um, essentially runs everything in the country. Um, the Haitian president today, there's no parliament which has the responsibility to have oversight um, so the Chamber of Deputies is gone. 
completely. There's no lower chamber. The Senate um, is dysfunctional because it's supposed to have 30 members, um, but because there was no election, um, two thirds of them are no longer there. So there's only 10. And as a result, the Senate is dysfunctional and not working. And the president is ruling by decree. Donc, il prend décret, il décide qui ça loi, qui ça pas loi, retirer, racher, mettre, j'enlever. Et il y a un chef de police qui le retire, le mette, malgré que I told you before, the president suggests who the chief of police should be, but it is the constitutional right of the Senate to approve the, the police chief. Remember, that's the, well, that was back in the day, the only arm institution that we have. It was the police. Now the president restarted the army again. So he has the police, he has the army. He has the ministers with all of the budgets and that runs the country. He has the heads, um, he has placed the director general, so the heads of every single institution in the country. But he also is the one that has placed every single other member of um, the government, all the way down to the mayors and you know the Azeks and Kazakhs, which would sort of be, if you're in New York, it would be analogous to a community board, I suppose, or not the community board, but maybe the city council. So you, you really have a president that has all power, right? And that has demonstrated a willingness to um, do away with rules and laws that he doesn't like. Um, and I, I don't like to make this about a president, right? Because it is about institution, it is about constitutional law, and it is about law and order. And this is the reason why I really have a particular problem when folks who are in the diaspora, who should know better, um, decide that they will take this opportunity um, to amend the constitution. And the warning that I have about that is essentially what we're doing is back to a one man show, <laughs> the strong man that I mentioned earlier that we should never go back to if we have just a glimpse of respect for our history, right? For what we've experienced as a people, as a country. And we're basically turning that over to one man, right? Which is the president, the executive branch. Um, and what that does is that we are as a diaspora reinforcing the one thing that we all um, are afraid of in Haiti, which is that there's no respect for the rule of law. I mean, you could talk about corruptions, you could talk about crime, you could talk about whatever it is that you want, but at the end of the day, it's because the country does not have the rule of law. And what we're doing in circumventing our constitution is reinforcing, right? Um, once again, that might makes right. Um, disregarding the rule of law, disregarding the one thing that should be our guiding principle. Um, and it is, it saddens me, it angers me at times that for those of us who should know better, a lot of people don't, but because a lot of people don't follow this as closely, but for many of us who do follow this very closely, um, it, it, and people can have, you know, um, um, disagreement, obviously, uh, on these points, but I think we need to take, I've, I've asked friends to take this to this, this idea to his very logical and his very logical conclusion, right? 
I mean, you gotta, you gotta take this, how far can it go? Um, first of all, you know, we don't know what's gonna be, what's gonna be changed, right? What we do know is that the constitution says how you are allowed to make changes to it. And you have a process by which we want to do it because there's no legislature, um, which is to try to do this change um, through referendum. And again, um, our constitution uh, very clearly uh, says in article uh, 284.3, it prohibits, it strictly prohibits that um, a constitutional amendment is done by referendum. And why, why are we doing it by referendum? It's because there is the other two branches, but particularly the legislative branch that is supposed to do this with the president um, is not there. Why is it not there? Because the president didn't do elections, didn't hold elections. And so he has a job, which was to um, ensure that the institutions in the country are running, that elections are held. I know people are gonna say, but what about, what about, what about, you know, the, the oppositions and this and that and the other, you know, don't cry for me, Argentina. That's not really, that's neither here nor there, right? You have a job and you didn't do it, right? And so now you didn't do the job, but you get to benefit from not doing a job, which is to get rid of the parliament so that you can do what you want to do. Um, and we in the diaspora who are people who um, should know that obviously democracy is imperfect. We just experienced it here. We just realize here, even the United States, who we all thought was the beacon of democracy, we just realized how close the United States came to a coup, right? Um, a lot of people probably haven't realized, you know, the machinery that was in place. Um, had, had the people who organized this coup uh, been smart enough, um, we would still probably have a President Trump. Um, because if you imagine that if those people who broke into the Capitol building had breached completely the Capitol building and had taken the vice president who they had planned to, um, to hang and they had taken um, Mrs. Pelosi, right? Um, there would have been a constitutional crisis and President Trump would have declared a state of emergency and he probably would have had 75 million people in the country who would be right behind him to say, yes, um, this president needs to stay because we are in a state of emergency. So we were really close. And yet, and yet we saw what happens. We saw that elected members of Congress, even after being attacked that same day, they went back that same night, they went back to work and finished the job, I believe it was until three or four in the morning. Um, the ideal of democracy is worth it. And this experience of building um, democratic processes and ideals is worth it. And so I'm, I'm making this, this exchange and I, I see some comments, you know, Donald, you agree with this point. I hope you agree with the other points as well. Um, um, and I see that, uh, uh, you know, there are other folks who've commented. We, we need to be, at least the, those of us who are here in the United States, and I, I have a lot of, you know, friends in Haiti who feels the same, um, people who are in Haiti to feel the same about sort of the way in which we need to undertake this. And um, we need to stay within the constitution. Now, um, one could argue that yes, there is an opportunity to do this because the parliament would never agree, right? To reduce its own power, granted. And if we were to take that to its logical end, 
then one would say, what would be the best process for um, uh, engaging in this kind of a change, right? And it seems that the best way that one would go about doing this is to engage you know, Haitian civil society, um, organize Haitian civil society. And by organize, I mean, the, the, the associate, the associations, right? The, so the press associations, um, the, the university association, um, the Les Barreaux des Avocats, um, which is the lawyers, the lawyers associations, um, you know, all of those groups within civil society who kind of are supposed to be the representative body or voices of the larger majority should be, you know, involved. And, and we hear the, 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 the international community tell this all the time, you know, the Haitian civil society needs to sit down and have a conversation and negotiate. And I, I believe that if, if, if the president wanted to do this in good faith, that it, the harder but best process would have been to sit with um, Haitian civil society to find agreement on how to move forward on making constitutional amendment. Instead, what he decided to do, and it started, we saw, we saw this from the time that he um, wanted to put in place his electoral council, again, um, illegally, unconstitutionally, um, a, he selected uh, whomever he wanted to put in that council because um, the organized institutions, the organized associations who are supposed to be the bodies that send members to the, the to their members to the electoral council, the, you know, the church, um, um, education, um, um, who else? This the, the bunch of, uh, 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 the, uh, institution associations um, that were supposed to send their, their representative had you know, said that they were not participating in the charade. And so they, they did not. And if the church doesn't send a representative, you know there's something wrong, the, particularly the Catholic church, because um, they usually are the strongest uh, a body in terms of uh, uh, being engaged in politics in Haiti, influencing politics in Haiti. So from there, he, you know, the, the electoral council was supposed to take their oath in front of the court, the members of the, the court, um, the Supreme Court in Haiti um, turned down the, uh, the request to um, actually uh, sit the electoral council, right? Um, they, you know, the, 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 they decided that the, the, they would not send a, a representative. So the church didn't send one, as I mentioned before. Um, the private sector, which is another organized group, did not send anybody. The universities did not send anybody. The human rights organization did not send anyone. So, you know, and, and, and this, they didn't send anyone. And, you know, the, the, the court did not um, uh, uh, give the oath. And unless you take the oath, as everybody knows, unless you took the oath, you, you, you're not uh, legally um, in that position. And regardless, um, the president decided that he was going to install his electoral council and he did. So I think, you know, we, we understand that we're not dealing with someone that is um, doing something in good faith. And um, as a result, I think we should all be very leery about what is going to be in this constitutional amendment. One of the fears is that this president is going to include, or I'm, I'm saying this president because since he selected the supposedly independent commission that's working on the amendments, um, uh, they will certainly, you know, one of the options is to say that the president can run f 
for a second uh, a second term, um, consecutive term. Today's constitution says that no president can have can serve two consecutive terms, right? So if you were president this term, um, you pass the baton to to another president, and then you can come back later on, which is what we believe um, President Martelly is trying to do, which is what we believe that um, that was done in the past um, with uh, President Aristide. So we call it, you know, doing a Putin, right? Putin was president and he took his prime minister, made his prime minister president. Then the prime minister held election and Putin became president again. And then Putin decided, you know what? I'm just gonna change the constitution so I can stay a little bit longer. And there we go. So, and, and of course you, we see what's happening in, 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 in Russia today. Human rights, you know, do not exist. Um, uh, oppositions do not exist. Um, and I know we, 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 when we think in terms of Haiti, we think of oppositions, uh, bagay, boule, etc. Opposition is not, it's not that, right? Opposition is, is a vital um, part of our democracy. So the Democrats here are in power, the Republicans are the opposition. The, the, the Republicans are in power, the Democrats are the opposition. Um, so there is a fear, there's a concern that um, this president is going to include something that allows him to stay in office, right? We don't know. There is a, 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 a true opacity that is involved in this process. There are total illegality, unconstitutionality that are engaged in this process. And so the idea that we as a Haitian diaspora are sitting and meetings to, in some ways, give fodder or support what is about to take place because we might get the, the ability to run for office in Haiti. And by running for office today, the current constitution, the amended constitution does not allow um, for um, someone who has dual nationality to hold um, any office higher than mayor. That means you cannot be deputies, you cannot be senator, certainly not president. And what the, you know, they're dangling in front of the diaspora and what many of the leaders in the diaspora are asking for is the ability to run for higher office, primarily to be president, which is a sickness that I don't really understand with many of our Haitian leaders um, who, all want to be president. I honestly do not understand it, but whatever. Um, Mona Lisa, you ask uh, how are these amendments going to get approved? Well, the process is um, to, to have this referendum, which as I mentioned earlier, is prohibited by the constitution. And so we basically discarding the constitution, we are gonna have a, a referendum, right? We're discarding the constitution um, um, we are having a, a constitutional amendment, even though there is no parliament um, to initiate the process as the constitution asks. We sat uh, an electoral council um, illegally and constitutionally because that's what we want. So this is where we are. And my case for Haitian Americans and folks who are in, in um, Haitians who are living overseas is to say that we should be striving for democracy in Haiti. Yes, it will be hard, but it is possible. The problems that we have, in my view, is one of law and order. We don't want to respect law and order. And us, as Haitian Americans, sometimes we go to Haiti and we don't want to follow law and order. And I think we do a disservice to the country and to ourselves when we do that. And I believe if we go along with this particular process that we are, um, we're cementing, um, we are really, 
n'a pas enterré la démocratie, n'a pas tué la démocratie, n'a pas enterré la démocratie en Haïti. Um, which, which saddens me as, as someone who loves, loves my country, as many others I'm sure do. Um, and so, yes, Mona Lisa, you know, the conversation is about transition, but it has to be a, 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 an, an organized transition. And of course, a lot of people are afraid of the word transition. But once again, because we are a country that has never really res respected um, the processes, uh, the Constitution accounted for that. <laughs> the Constitution accounted for the fact that, one, if election doesn't take place at a particular time, then um, regardless of when it happens, um, uh, the, the, the term of the president will begin on X time and, and on Y time. It's not five years counting five years. It's five years counting to the date that the, the election was supposed to take place. And so you may lose a year, you may lose two years. The constitution doesn't really care. Your job was to have election. You didn't have election and therefore whatever time it takes to do have that election, someone will lose that time so that we stay at that same rhythm, right? Um, and the constitution also does have account for a transition. And it says that if, you know, the president, something happens to the president that they're sick, they're ill, they die or whatever, they can't make it in their first three years, they would be replaced by the prime minister. And if it's in the last, you know, I, I think the last year, don't hold me to that, um, the last year or the last two years, they would be replaced by, uh, a member of the constitutional court. Um, of course, because things are so upside down and hated, last time this happened, the parliament um, um, took hold of that power and they put in um, uh, Privel, who was uh, President Privel, who was um, uh, uh, in the Senate. And he, he spent a year in, in office and he held election for the first time hit election with Haitian money without international communities money because the international community said that they would not support the election and he found the money. So we can do it, <laughs> we can do it. Um, so all of these things I think are reasons uh, uh, why you know we, we need to make sure that we respect the constitution. So um, the diaspora is getting a lot of attention today because um, it's not because they were giving the diaspora a seat at the table, not because they want the diaspora to be a partner. Now, let's just be clear. Everywhere in the world, and for those of you who live in the United States, you've heard of the word, the term gerrymandering. Politicians um, do not want competition, so they find ways to minimize their competition. Um, so the idea that um, th that you know they are going to open um, uh, the vote to let's just say two millions or three millions, three millions um, Haitians who live abroad uh, is not something that is going to be easy. But they are approaching the diaspora because they realize that the diaspora could be this particular government needs legitimacy. The only reason why it's approaching the diaspora is because it needs legitimacy. And therefore it is attempting to buy our silence. It is attempting to buy our conscience by offering us one, something we already have, which is dual nationality. And two, a right that we should have, which is the ability to vote where we are, to have an ID card and vote where we are. The additional thing that it could include, which is the ability for Haitian Americans to be able to run for higher office, deputy, senator, and president, is the only additional thing that they could put in there. And I'm sure there will be limitations. You have to live in the country for an X number of years. There will be something like that. And from my perspective, even if we were to get that, I think it's, a too, it's too high of a price for us to pay relative to what we are going to lose in terms of the rule of law. Now, 
Nandi, you mentioned, we can't ignore international external interventions that have disrupted or and or suspended our constitution. You said it right, external interventions. That means it's something abnormal, right? It's like your body and you have an external thing that enters your body, of course, it's gonna do damage. That is not the model to replicate, right? Doing the bad thing that we know was bad because the international community did it is no reason for us to then do it to ourselves. But my concern is less about the outside because um, democratic ideals and principles are internal to us. And the idea that we would willfully disregard everything that is um, normative for, for a country to, to grow, for us to completely rip our constitution um, will be a terrible, will have terrible repercussion, right? Those will have long-term repercussions because what it will do is that it will ensure that either this man stay in power, this president, or the next person who comes and takes power will also um, attempt to change the constitution to fit what he or she, although it's generally a he, I hope at some point a she in Haiti, will come and change that. And the reason that is, is because the hard part of building democracy is hard and it's never perfect. We see after 212 years, whatever it is here in the United States, um, how easily uh, someone was, um, got close, right? to, to uh, really uh, throw out this American experience. Um, we in Haiti who have had not had um, that consistent right um, experience should not be the one um, who willfully engage in that process. And so I'm not suggesting to folks that I'm right. I am simply suggesting that we have a constitution and that we can't be both pregnant and 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 uh come on back Lindsay. uh you can't be you can't be both pregnant and not pregnant at the same time you either one or the other don't we either want the rule of law and if we do want the rule of law then we need to follow the constitution if we find we as a country collectively find that there is a necessity to make a modification. We need to agree on it. But the idea that we're gonna allow a single person to come in and ru run all the institutions, select his buddies to put on a committee, on a commission and make changes um, by offering us trinkets, we're gonna accept those changes as a diaspora. I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a, a terrible, um, uh, things to start, a uh, terrible precedent to set. So it's that's really what I wanted to do. I'm hoping that next time that we will continue to have more conversation. Um, we will try to cover uh, subjects like this. We would in the future bring, you know, some guests. Uh, this show, Joe's Corner, will happen every fourth Sunday. Mo's Corner will happen every first Sunday. And you know, Mo's will have a focus more on uh, uh, issues that uh, ladies care about, and Joe's corner will have a focus on the things that the fellas care about. Um, but we will also bring issues such as this one, where I can have a conversation um, with all of you. So thank you for watching, for being part of this first uh, uh, Joe's corner. I look forward to a subsequent one and on behalf of um, myself, but also of the team, uh, Sam and Onalisa, I say thank you and have a wonderful week. Um, next time, please um, share and um, have more questions because I wanna have a dialogue with all of you. 
um, don't hesitate to uh, to write to us um, at uh, info at uh, Le Mojo Show, c'est L-E-M-O-G-O Show, S-H-O-W, at Le Mojo Show, uh, dot com. And um, we'll make sure that uh, we'll respond. We care for your ideas. We care for your suggestions and look forward to subsequent conversation. So thank you and good night. I never found someone like you.